Lord's house today. If you turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 15, and we'll continue a series uh, on the obedience of faith, a series that we've been dealing with um, since we were in chapter 12 for about four months, and chapter 13, chapter 14, now in chapter 15. Uh, the obedience of faith is the belief that through the supernatural salvation of God, that we are living obedient lives because the Holy Spirit is producing transformation, change, sanctification, making us more like Jesus. This is one of the things that we believe as a tenet of our faith is that when a person is born again, that they are changed from the inside out. Uh, we believe that this happens by God's grace. This is not something we do for ourselves. This is something God does in our life and through our lives. God doesn't... Uh, create new life in us for us to return like a dog does to its vomit we we want to follow Christ we want to follow Jesus and so this desire is there and this uh, power is there this strength is there to live an obedient life and that's what Paul uh, was preaching the gospel and doing to produce the obedience of faith this is what the Lord is by his by his power and glory is desiring to take place and is doing through us is bringing about a life of obedience that springs from saving faith in Christ. Then we kind of jumped and leaped into a mini series on chapters uh, 15 verses 5 and 6 that deals with one mind and one accord with one voice. Now when I started this I was going to do one mind one accord and one voice in one sermon. It ended up being uh, now three, uh, this is the third sermon. We spent a week talking about being of one mind. We spent a week talking about being in one accord and unity. And now we're going to talk about today, one voice. Look with me in the scripture, if you would, to verse 4, Romans chapter 15. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one accord according to Christ Jesus so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, I'm gonna, let's pray together as a church. Let's pray for these three things. God, we believe your word today. We believe that the, all that is written through the prophets, all that it was written in the gospels, all that was written before this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, chapter 15 of Romans, God, was to bring about hope in our life that the God of heaven gives perseverance and encouragement in our life and God, we as a church, this little church, Crossroads Baptist Church, this body of believers that springs out of County Road 229 in Social Circle, Georgia, God, I pray today that you would grant to us that we would have the same mind, that the mind that we have for you and for one another, a mind to glorify God and a mind to love each other and to be honest with each other, a mind that is for each other, according to Christ Jesus. One mind, one tongue, not double-tongued, one face, not two-face, one mind toward each other, toward Christ, glorifying God and loving and fighting for each other and that we would with one accord be unified and with one voice that we would glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. One mind and one accord with one voice. God, you've said in your word here that you will grant this to us and so we as a body of believers in faith today come to you believing your word and believing God that you would help us, Crossroads Baptist Church, the people of God here in this church, that we would be unified together for the glory of God. That we would love each other, forgive each other, that we would fight for our relationships with one another, that we would, God, desire to have one voice, 
Help us to know what that means today. One voice to this world. One voice to each other. That we be on the same mind and heart and page, God, together. So that the world might know you and love you and follow you and have hope also in your name. To the glory of God we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How do we walk in unity as a church? We walk with one mind and one accord. We talked about first in this passage of Scripture, verses 1 through 6, 1 through 4. We looked at specifically putting others first. Then we talked about God granting unity to us is what we just prayed about, verses 5 and 6. And we talked about having the same mind, uh, being of the same mind. You can go back and listen uh, several weeks ago as we talked about that. Uh, what all that means and having the mind of Christ and not being uh, double-minded, not being double-tongued, not being two-faced, but being genuine, being real. Uh, also, we talked about living in one accord last week. We talked about unity and what that looks like and, and what that is all about. And now today we get to this place of, of having one voice. What does it mean to have one voice? As the Lord's command here is to be and to do. One voice. Let me just say, this is our body. Those who are gathered here together, there are others who aren't here today, but they're, they are among us. They are counted ones. They, are, they, are, they belong to this local body of believers. We, each of us, have a, a voice. We're all saying something. And the scripture here is calling that, by the grace of God that God would grant to us that we would have one voice, that each of us have a voice, but we don't, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily at times saying the same thing. At times, we're saying things, communicating things that are different from each other, and the Scripture is calling for us to be and to have the same mind, the same, to be uh, one with each other in the sense to have unity, but have a, one voice. How do we line up with one voice? Each of us has a voice. We are all speaking in different ways. Some are speaking, we speak with our fingertips. We speak with our thumbs. Probably a lot more speaking with our thumbs. And I'm just going to tell you all, that does not work for these thumbs very well. How long did it take for us with an iPhone 3 to learn how to type with our thumbs? We're also speaking with our tongues. We speak with our mouths. We have a voice. We're saying things. We're saying what we think. We're saying what we believe. And the prayer for us is to have one voice. The voice of truth communicated to the world in the midst of such a critical time that we have one voice and that we all collectively be speaking with one voice, a voice of truth. So how do we do that? What are some of the criteria? How do we line up together? How is it that we collectively are unified with the voice, what we're proclaiming? And just in case you don't know, you have a voice. You are all preaching something. Y'all remember our teacher saying, if you can't say anything nice, what is, it? what is the expression? If you can't say anything nice, what? Don't say anything at all. Let me, let's, let's back up just for a minute. If you're not communicating truth, then don't say anything at all. What is truth? What is true? What is right? What does the world need to hear? What does the world need to hear from the church unified with one voice? What are we saying? Piercing through darkness with light, truth, hope. Let's talk about first, foremost. 
And we lead from, we follow from the apostles. We follow from what the apostles believed was to be a common thread, a common theme of what they were saying. What were they proclaiming? Paul says it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We proclaim the cross. Look here at the scripture, 1 Corinthians 1. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross. The cross. This, my friend, is to be a common theme of our voice now and forever, the cross of Christ. If we should think, what is it that we are communicating to the world, communicating to the world, communicating to the world, it is to be the cross of Christ. If we're going to line up with one voice, then let us line up with the apostles in what was being preached constantly. The word of the cross. The reason why we do not preach the cross, speak the cross, present our voice to the world about the cross is because it is foolishness to the world. And that is not fun when you are communicating what to the world is foolishness and the world presents back to you how stupid and how foolish and how ignorant that you are. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. That is what is happening in America. If you don't realize this, that is what's happening in our nation today because we have a nation collectively that has believed the wisdom of the world and that man can solve his own problems through secular humanism. And God, I will, God will destroy the wisdom of the wise. God will show people that their wisdom is folly. And the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. If anything, what the message of God is to America today is you cannot solve your own problems. Your cleverness will never get you there. So as we, the church, presenting with one voice the message of the cross, it is foolishness to the cleverness of the world. The wisdom of the world? Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And I would stand back looking from the outside, because I do believe I'm on the outside, looking, looking at the world today, I would say, if nothing else, we are looking at how pitiful man is. Pitiful man is at solving problems. And charting its course. Pitiful. Pitiful. God is making it all foolish. The wisdom of the world. It's, it's as if God is saying, you have tried it your way. Here's what you get. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. All of your wisdom, all of your debating, all of your scribes, those who want to copy what other people are saying, the wisdom of the world, and then people copy the wisdom of the world, and then they find it does not lead men to God. The world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Here's the beauty of preaching the cross. It will lead to salvation to those who believe. We're not preaching the cross so that we can be popular with man. 
we are preaching the cross, what will in fact happen is people will think that we're absolutely lost our mind. But to some who believe will lead to their eternal salvation. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign and Greeks search for wisdom. Think about the Apostle Paul preaching in Corinth, preaching in Rome, preaching in Galatia, preaching all throughout Asia in the Roman Empire. You don't hear anything. You don't hear any proclamation that men or governments or the Roman Empire will save your life or the Roman Empire will Will, uh, you will lose your life. All that is proclaimed is the cross of Calvary. The Apostle Paul was not relying on the Roman Empire. He was not relying on any other religion on the face of the earth. He was totally reliant on the power of the cross of Calvary to bring life to people. The wisdom of the world today says this political party or that political party will save us. I've heard over and over, and listen, y'all, some of y'all are going to be so mad at me today, you can, you can spit. But listen to me. People are saying this party or that party. Many people are saying that this is the most important election that we've ever had. Garbage. Garbage. We do not trust in men. We don't trust in chariots. We don't trust in horses. We don't trust in men. We trust in the name of the Lord, our God. And let me just say this, church. If if there does not come a mighty move of God and the power of God and the revival of the church, if it's not this election, it'll be another. You say, why are you talking about this? Because I'm wrong and because you're wrong. We're wrong to trust in governments to save our land. We're wrong. We're not just wrong, we're dead wrong. And we lose our voice when we despair because of this candidate or that candidate. We lose our voice to this world to proclaim that we are not trusting in man. We are not trusting in governments. We are trusting in the name of the Lord our God. And I know exactly who's going to be in the White House in January. I know exactly who's going to be there. It is who God wants to be there. There's no October surprise that's going to change the deal. There's no coronavirus or sickness or anything else, any other measure. The person that's going to be in that White House is the person God puts there, either for our blessing or our cursing or both. When we despair, when we get caught up in politics, when we preach politics more than we preach the cross, we lose our voice. We communicate to this world that our hope is in a party rather than our hope being in the Lord our God. Told you you're going to be mad. Some of you politicians, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians. I love freedom. And I love and thank God for those who gave us that freedom. I love this country. I love this place where I can freely stand and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this place. I love you. I love living where I live. I love social circle Georgia. And I love it enough to proclaim the truth to it, that our only hope is in the Lord our God. And the reason I'm saying this so passionately is because I feel my own temptation to despair or to hope in some election. I feel my own mind and heart getting led astray away from the message of the cross of Calvary. Shame on me. Shame on us 
if we are proclaiming more about governments and parties than we are the cross of Calvary. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Gentiles foolishness. This is our plight when we proclaim the cross. To some it will be a stumbling block, to others it will be foolishness. But to some, he says, but to those who are the called, the called. That's why we proclaim the cross. Because the called, just like us, the called out ones, both Jews and Greece, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is, the, is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. One voice, church, one voice. Or they are going to sadly be misunderstood. We are going to sadly be misunderstood as to think that we believe in our hearts that the tide of this world, that the tide of our nation goes by the way of politicians. Some of you right now, you're hoping in a Supreme Court justice to change the slaughter of little babies. Look, those little babies, those little babies, we don't put our hope in Supreme Court justices. We've had the court before, friends. Conservatives have had the court, and they did nothing about Roe v. Wade. They did nothing. Who's to say they're going to do anything now? Stop trusting in men. Those babies are in God's hands. And in the hands of evil men who would take their lives, slaughter them in the wombs, there should no, be no safer place than the womb, than a mother's womb. And our nation has this plight to go in and slaughter little babies in the wombs. Friend, let me tell you, until God starts changing people's hearts with the gospel and the cross of Calvary, if it's not this election, it'll be another. The tide is shifted. The tide, the, the, the tidal wave is crashing on us. People's hearts turned and bent toward wickedness. And the reason is, the reason is, is the church has lost its voice. A voice of truth. I do not blame politicians. I don't blame neighborhoods. I don't blame mommies and daddies. I blame preachers who stop preaching the cross and the word of God. They stopped believing in the inerrancy of Scripture. And their mainline denominations have denied the inerrancy of Scripture, denied that this word, every word of it is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Every single word is breathed by God. And when we, do, when we do that, when we deny the authority of Scripture, when we deny the inerrancy of Scripture, it's every man for himself. A lot of people in church today, a lot of people listening to different voices, different people proclaiming truth, many of which, many of which who are pastors in pulpits that are no better than a politician. Every Sunday, it's, it's jockeying for the approval of men. It's making people love them and give their money to them. It's nothing but a money machine. Say what men want you to say. Deny what men want you to deny. Say what's popular. Tickle people's ears. Shame on us. That is why we are where we are. I've lost our voice. Crossroads, listen, we cannot, we cannot. I'm not preaching to other churches. I'm preaching to Crossroads. This is the place where God has called me as a shepherd, called me as a pastor to lead you to have one voice preach the cross of Calvary. Tell them of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Tell them the judgment to come. Tell them the grace of God that's available. Tell them the forgiveness of God. Tell them that the blood of Jesus is able to wash and cleanse their sin. But what they hear. Now listen, I just want you to know I don't read social media. 
I literally, I've been on Facebook for I think all of three minutes. That was years and years ago. Could not stand it. I don't care what you're having for dinner. I'm sorry. That's terrible for me to say, but I just don't care. I don't care that you got braces, that, that you, yeah, what? I just don't. I'm sorry. I mean, I care about lots of things about you, but what you had to di for dinner or, you know, you bought a new jacket or I don't know. You caught a big fish. I mean, I, I really kind of care about that. But anyway, <laughs> I don't care. But I'm not reading, so please don't. Don't take this as that I am following you or, you know, liking you. I know about those things because I hear about those things, but I don't really know what that is. But anyway, that's not why I'm preaching this today. I hear things. Some people will tell me, oh, Pastor, don't read what people are talking about. Don't read what people are saying. Don't read what they're hoping in. Don't read what they're proclaiming. Don't read it because it's going to make you upset. Listen, I'm not saying this because I've read something or I'm talking to somebody specifically, but I want you all to look at me as your pastor today. If you are talking more about politics than you are about the cross of Christ, you, my friend, are wrong. Because you're sending a message from Crossroads Baptist Church that we are hoping in government rather than in the name of the Lord our God. One voice. You say, it doesn't matter what I say. You are a part of this little church on County Road 229. You are a messenger. You are an ambassador. You are a member of this body of believers, and we need to be telling the world the same thing, and that is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for them. Doesn't matter what color their skin is. Doesn't matter what their political party is. Doesn't matter what their views are. Doesn't matter what their background is. Doesn't matter what language they speak. Doesn't matter where they come from. What matters is that Jesus died on the cross and his blood can forgive their sin and heal their life. We send this message that you're only, I can only be close to you if you agree with me about my politics. And if you don't agree with me about my politics, I don't even want to be around you. What a horrible message that we could send to the world through the church. Horrible, horrifying that we've boiled our life down to the trust in government rather than a trust in the name of the Lord our God. Not only do we preach the cross, but we preach the word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says, I solemnly charge you. I solemnly charge you. He's talking to a young pastor. I take this personally. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. He says that we preach Christ and him crucified, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then he says we preach, we are to preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. To reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with great patience and instruction. Those are some powerful words, two of which don't sound fun. Reprove doesn't sound fun. Rebuke doesn't, doesn't not sound fun. Exhort sounds good. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So-called Christians, so-called church members, gathering preachers to tell them what they want to hear. But you be sober in all things, endure hardships, do the work in evangelists, fulfill your ministry. What should we do, church, if we find ourselves living in a culture that will not endure sound doctrine or find ourselves preaching to uh, people who call themselves Christians who will not endure sound doctrine? What should we do? What should we do? Preach the word. Preach the word. What should we do if we find ourselves living in a culture where people want to have their ears tickled? Preach 
the word. What should we do if we find ourselves living in a culture that accumulate for themselves teachers who say what they want them to say, what their personal desires want them to say? We should preach the word. What should we do if we find ourselves living in a culture where people turning away from truth and turn aside to myths? Christians talking about numerology. Well, this number adds up to this number, and that's my, you know, this number, and then you add those two together, and that's my, that's my uh, grandfather's birthday. Who cares? Well, that's a sign. No, you're, you're a loony bird. I want a sign. Turning aside to myths. Turning aside to psychology. Turning aside to social humanism. You hear more humanism from Christians today than you hear the Word of God. If you don't know what to tweet, if you don't know what to post, post the Word of God. You can probably find something in the Word of God that speaks to the situation. All you scribes out there, all you debaters out there, you know what a scribe is? A scribe is someone who writes down what someone else said. That you say, this person says truth, and then I am the scribe. I then retweet or repost what this person said, and you are ultimately lining up with that person. You are then a scribe. You are then a debater, and you are then pro propagating what this person is propagating to the world. How about let's line up with the Word of God? Please, church. Please, Brandon. Stop trusting in man. Despair. We're not to despair. Those who have hope do not despair in circumstances unless our hope is misplaced. What are you hoping in? Life. My hope is in life. There's only one who can give life. Super natural life miracle working power when you appropriate life and you appropriate wisdom and you appropriate answers with what the world has to offer friend you are propagating foolishness to this world we lose our One voice. That's what, the, that's what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 15, that God can, will, grant to us. And that's what I'm praying for today. Will you pray with me, church, that we have one. He says to reprove. He said, what does it mean to preach the word? What does that mean? Pastor Brandon, what does it mean if I'm going to be a preacher of the word? I'm not a preacher. He's talking to a preacher. I'm not a preacher. You are preaching something, friend. You are absolutely preaching. You are a scribe. You're copying down. You're voicing. You're communicating to the world answers. Answers. 
What does it mean to preach the word? He says three things, to reprove, to rebuke, and exhort. These are the three things that it means. This is what it means to preach the word, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort. To reprove means to say, you are wrong. That's fun to do, isn't it? You are wrong. That's what it means. When you reprove, when you preach the Word of God, in many places from the Word of God, it says, you are wrong. Your thinking is wrong. Your attitude is wrong. Your talking is wrong. Your, uh, your philosophy is wrong. Your ideas are wrong. You are wrong. That's what the Bible says. When you speak Preach the word of God many times. You are saying to this world, to yourself, to your children, to your wife, to your husband, you are wrong. And I've had that happen to me many times by that little lady on the back row back there. I have been reproved and I don't like it. Thank God for it. You are wrong. And she says it just like that. So now you are wrong. <laughs> Any other husbands want to be, want to be uh, honest and say, I've heard those words. You are wrong. Your attitude's, your attitude's wrong. <laughs> you need to stop saying that. That's Wrong. Anybody? Thank you, Lord, for reproof. Somebody who loves me enough to reprove me. And in the church, with one voice, we preach the word. We reprove each other. We say to each other, you're wrong. And we've got to be mature enough and have enough wisdom and have enough grace to hear that from each other and say, yes, that is wrong. And many times it's a light clicks on and, the, you know, you're asleep and the light, oh, that hurts. But you're wrong. Stop it. That's what it means to preach the word to each other. That's what it means to preach the Word. That's what it means to read the Word. That's what it means to hear the Word. You are wrong. How many times do we read the Bible and it say to us, you are wrong? And when we speak to the world, many, many times, and we don't realize this is where the anger comes from and where the frustration and where people say we're foolish and people will even ultimately persecute and where we ultimately lose our freedom to say such things, Potentially, you'll realize that's the next step of this wave, right? Unless there come a revival in the church, a revival among the Protestants, a revival of God's Word, a revival of the belief and the inerrancy of Scripture, a revival of preaching, expositional preaching and teaching, or preaching the Word of God, unless there be a revival, y'all realize that's what's coming next. To where even the Protestants will persecute the church for saying what the Bible says and standing with an absolute truth of morality. We get so busy. We get so busy arguing with lost people about absolute truth of morality. Friend, that's the wrong argument, that's the wrong approach. Preach the cross. Preach the blood of Jesus. Preach the resurrection of Christ. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're trying to convince someone who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe in creation, who doesn't believe in absolute truth, who doesn't believe in a standard of morality, that they're wrong about their morality when they hate God. That's why Paul preached the cross. It pierces through the darkness. He preached the cross of Christ because the called will hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Reprove, you're wrong. Rebuke. You say, those sound alike. They are similar, but it is to check with reproof 
To rebuke is to check someone. It is to stop them in their tracks. To reprove them means you're wrong. To rebuke them is add, adding in this argument of checking them and stopping them and, and slowing down this momentum that they're going in, okay? It's the direction of their life. And so when you rebuke someone, you reprove them, you say you're wrong. To rebuke them means you check them and you bring in an argument that says stop. And this is why you should stop. We check people to restrain them. We check them to restrain them. We check them. We rebuke them. So we say, come away from that course. You're going the wrong direction. You're going the wrong way. Stop it. And in some ways, I'm sharing some things, specific things to stop doing today. Stop your course. You can hear it and listen to it. You can be reproved. You can be restrained. You can hear the rebuke or not. Keep trusting Keep trusting in chariots. Keep trusting in horses. Keep trusting in armies. Keep trusting in politics. Keep trusting in this. Keep trusting in football. Keep trusting in your team. Keep trusting the Braves. Keep tr just keep on trusting. Guess what's going to happen with all Atlanta sports? <laughs> keep trusting. What's going to happen? Oh, friend, you're going to come in here really sad. There's going to be a couple of Sundays this year. You're going to come in here really sad because you're trusting in the wrong things. You're hoping, 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 wanting. I'm not being prophetic here. I'm just telling you, friend, when you trust in anything but the cross and you trust in anything the Word of God, you trust in anything but the providence of God, you trust in anything other than God, it's going to let you down, friend. It's going to lead to despair. It's going to lead to heartbreak. So in that way, I am bringing this argument of restraint. Stop. Stop heading that way. Stop and look up. Look to the cross. Look to the Word of God. It is also to check to silence. I'm going to give you, <laughs> I'm going to give you in rebuke, I'm going to give you a reason to be silent, to stop talking, to know what you're saying, and know that what you're saying is true. Stop speaking until you know that what you're saying is true. Rebuke is to check, it's to cause silence. We talk too much. Amen? Pastor, y'all look, looking at me. Long sermons. You talk too much. It just says shut up for now. Until you say something true, shut up. You're not supposed to say. Micah's dad hates that. I used to, he used to be so mad. He was my youth pastor. When we said, oh, man, you say shut up. Oh, you in trouble. But that's what the Bible tells us. Stop talking. Don't say anything unless you are speaking truth. That is how we line up. That's how we have one voice is we line up what we say with the word of God. And we wait. We're patient. We don't speak out of emotion. I am an emotional person, y'all. That's what really hurts me sometimes is because I speak before I think because I let my emotions cause me to say things that I shouldn't be leaning on. I shouldn't be trusting in. I should not be presenting this as an answer to the world. We check, we rebuke, we check to silence, we check to restrain, we check to heal. We rebuke to heal people. You know that? It's wrong to feel that way. We really, we rebuke to heal. You say, how in the world, Pastor, can you rebuke to heal? Listen, unless you change the way you feel about this, unless you change the way you are feeling about this circumstance in your life, it's going to hurt you. It's going to cause pain. It's going to cause suffering. It's going to cause despair. It's going to cause anxiety. It's going to cause depression. you got to stop thinking this way. 
That's a hard one to hear, isn't it? That's a hard one to hear from the people that we love, the people that love us, to say, you got to stop. You can't, you can't be feeling that way. It's, it's a dark road. It's going to lead you off course. It's a rebuke, but it's to heal. It is also restrained to calm. A restrained to calm, a restrained to heal, a restrained to calm, and it really corrects, and these should be reversed. I should have reversed them at least in this service, but it, it corrects our think. You shouldn't be thinking that way. You shouldn't be thinking that way. Because usually what we're saying is what we're thinking. And when we're saying the wrong thing, it's definitely because we got stinking thinking. You're thinking the wrong way. And that thinking is going to be leading you to feeling the wrong way. And that's going to lead to a lot of trouble for you, for the people that are listening to you, for the people around you. Because that's wrong. Stop. You know, to cite an extreme with this is someone who hates themselves. They hate who they are. It's extreme thinking that it's going to hurt you. You don't, you don't love that God has made you fearfully and wonderfully made by God. That you're exact, you created exactly the way God wanted you to be for the purpose of God. You stop believing that. You start believing the lies of hell. And you stop hating your life. You start hating your circumstance. You start hating waking up in the mornings. And that's where we need to hear this rebuke that says, stop thinking. Stop thinking that way. Stop feeling that way. Stop. People begin to hate themselves and begin to think about hurting themselves. And it's sinful. Repent. Turn away from thoughts of self harm hurting yourself. Repent. Turn away. What does that mean, Pastor Brandon? You take that thought captive. You imprison that thought. And you, you turn away from that thought and you begin to dwell on and you begin to think upon the word of God that says that you are fearfully and wonderfully created by God exactly the way you are. Joshua Jackson is created the exact person that he is supposed to be. We love that. Joshua's to love that. Amen? Amen? We're to celebrate that. We even celebrate what is by the providence of God and the hand of God of what has taken place in our past and what has taken place and not living with regret, not living with shame, not living with condemnation, but know that God can take what the enemy has meant for harm and God can produce in that and bring about through that a life that brings glory and honor to the King of Kings and that I would never be like that person that hurt me. I would never be like that person that sinned against my life. That God would make me the type of person that brings healing to others and never harm. This is where these extreme thoughts, that where the truth of God's word pierces through darkness and brings hope and life and encouragement to people around us. One voice. To reprove, to rebuke, and then to exhort to encourage with great patience and instruction, to encourage, to embolden, to cheer on, to advise. The primary sense to be to excite each other, give strength to each other, give a, pour into each other a spirit to fight for the glory of God and relationships and to 
to bring about an argument, an encouragement, an encouragement to someone that causes them to be excited about glorifying God and honoring God with their life, excited about serving the Lord, excited about living for God, excited about preaching the cross and the Word of God. That's what encouragement is. And I love that, and I need that in my life. I need people in my life to excite my heart about serving the Lord and being on fire for God and being thankful and being joyful and being peaceful. Amen, church. To, to pour out through my life the fruits of the Spirit of God to incite by words of advice, to give good instruction and good advice, and this is where to turn, and this is what you should do. This is what the Bible says that you should do. What, or to say to them, what does the Bible say? To preach and to herald the Word of God is not our own notions. It's not focusing on our own interests. It is to herald the pure, plain Word of God. We don't change it. We don't read into it. We don't add to it. We don't corrupt it with our own thoughts and our own opinions. We just say what the Bible says and trust that God will work in and through it. Sober-minded, evangelize, fulfill your ministry is what Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, reprove, rebuke, and encourage each other. Preach the word. With one voice, we proclaim that all of our hope and trust is in Jesus Christ. We preach and proclaim with one voice the supernatural creation of God, and we preach and proclaim the supernatural salvation of God. Two scriptures, and I close. Psalm 20, verse 7. Some boast in chariots, some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 146, 3. Do not trust in princes or in mortal men in whom there is no salvation. We don't trust in presidents or Supreme Court justices or employers or karma or good works or people or pastors or church leaders. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the Lord and we proclaim our trust in the Lord to the world right now in this moment. Amen, church.